Loving Lord, we thank you for everything concerning everything and everything. We ask for your blessing this day. We ask for you to enlighten our minds and our hearts to understand and comprehend the depth of your love and the spirit and the power of your church. Fill us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And manifest your light to us, we your underserving servants. Through the never-ending intercessions of the Lady of us all, the Holy Mother of God, St. Mary, all the choir of your heavenly saints, hear us and have mercy upon us and make us worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. As you know, we are um, starting a new series, uh, which we started last week, um, on basi basically on orthodoxy and apologetics. And we'll explain what that w word means if, if you're not familiar in the future. But basically, to go back to the basics to understand what our church is about and how, if uh, need be, to present that to our kids, to um, our co-workers, to our friends, or to anyone who asks us a reason for the hope of, uh, that is in us. So last time, if you remember, we spoke about, anyone remember? We spoke about three things. The Coptic Orthodox Church. <laughs> remember? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, and we were saying for the from the Coptic Coptic aspect, the the main point that we focus on is the history, right? And then we said from the church aspect, the main point we talk about is what Christianity is, and we go to the creed, which is the summary or the map of our faith. Okay, but when it comes to orthodoxy, we said. What? We look at the bases or the pillars of what the holy tradition is. And so today we're going to go a little bit more into what the holy tradition is for us. So like, just to remind us, so the Coptic history, so that will basically look at three M's, the monks, the martyrs, and the miracles, <coughs> um, or the monastic life that uh, Egypt was so unique with in the past, and even to some extent in the present. Um, and the, the martyrs, the same, same with the martyrs, uh, we're, we're very proud to offer up to the Lord a very sweet-smelling aroma over um, thousands of years. Um, and this is what makes the Coptic Church so unique. It doesn't make it better, but it makes it unique. And then um, the miracles that happen um, from generation to generation, including the present time. Um, so, so that's the Coptic part. And then we said the Orthodox part is, the, is the, the, the Holy Tradition, which is transferred from, again, generation to generation. And then finally, Christianity, like we said, is uh, summarized <coughs> with the Christian uh, creed of faith. And maybe in the future we'll go into depth, um, not to every phrase, because that would take an extended period of time, but at least the most important phrases, um, which is why the creed uh, uh, resulted over the years, okay? Um, so a lot of time when we talk about holy tradition or we try to present the church as a traditional church, it, it doesn't sound good in the ears of people who don't know what we're talking about, right? So oftentimes there's a negative connotation with the word. Um, and even in the Bible, uh, when the Lord and the apostles sometimes used the word, they were, they were referring to the negative connotation because people were misusing it okay um, like for example people get the wrong understanding when they hear that word <coughs> what do normal people or not normal people but people who, do, who are not orthodox um, think of when they hear this word they think oh you're cold you're not biblical you're authoritarian you're and inventing this word to maintain your power or authority over the people or the abuse of the leadership, which is what happened in the time of the Lord's Day. Um, Man-made customs uh, in, that, that are done in a legalistic sense, 
Um, and so that's why uh, St. Paul <coughs> writes uh, to the Colossians, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, uh, according to the tradition of men. Uh, again, this is not holy tradition, and we'll explain the difference. According to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Actually, he, uh, he defined it himself, what the differences are between the traditions of men and that of the God and the church. <coughs> Excuse me. So, he said, uh, the Lord also said, in, in the Gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 15, he says, Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect because of your tradition. Again, he's talking to the Pharisees here and um, not to the church in general. So, well, let's take a step back. W what do we mean when we use the word holy tradition? <coughs> uh, went into the dictionary and Miriam Webster says, it's the handing down orally of customs, beliefs, stories, and etc. from generation to generation. Yes, that's true, but it's not always oral. It's not always verbal because like we said last Sunday the Holy Bible is part of tradition. So it was handed down orally for, for a few generations or a few years until it was written down. Um, in Latin it comes from the word traditio. In Greek it's paradosis. Um, <coughs> but here it's, it's not just something handed down from one generation to the rest, but the same way like when one hands a baton to someone else, um, it's kept. It's kept. Like so, if you hand someone in a race the, the baton and they drop it, what happens? You lose the race, <laughs> right? So tradition is something that we don't we don't drop um, because the race depends on it. Uh, like like uh, Saint Paul uh, talks about, but I run the race. Um, but even with this definition, there's a, there's a deeper definition. Um, there's a deeper meaning here. Uh, and St. Athanasius, the apostolic in the 4th century, he wrote, um, says, beyond these scriptural sayings, let us look at the very tradition, teaching, and faith of the universal church from the beginning, which the Lord gave, the apostles preached, and the fathers kept. Uh, if, if you know, or if you've studied uh, the fathers that all this is one of the famous quotes that uh, a lot of people use from Saint Athanasius to talk about the importance of what the church is or what it does. So, so it's basically the tradition is something that God gave us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the apostles preached it, and then the church fathers, uh, the holy church fathers, kept it, um, and we also do our job to keep it from generation to generation. <coughs> And then he says, upon this the church is founded, and he who should fall away from it would not be a Christian. So he's not only saying he's not Orthodox, he's saying he's not a Christian if, if he doesn't keep this formula. Um, uh, and even the Lord, uh, sorry, St. Paul again says, as you therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Um, so basically what we're trying to say here is that tradition is the process of receiving Christ. Okay? Um, and the life of the church um, is this tradition. So the tradition is the life of the church <coughs> that, that we receive from Christ, uh, that he gave to the apostles, and um, uh, it was guided by the Holy Spirit, and the fathers kept it like the baton to pass it over to us, and what our responsibility is to also keep it and pass it to the next generation. So following the holy tradition helps us receive the Lord and walk in the Lord, and help others also receive and walk in the Lord uh, as well. Okay? Um, so, uh, this is uh, um, a mystery. But, like when we say that tradition is the life of the church imparted by the Lord Christ to the apostles and guided by the Holy Spirit, this is a way that we say we're living the transfiguration. Or God has revealed Himself to us and the way we live, we call it this tradition. Okay? Um, and this is what St. Paul talks about in, Philipp in Philippians when he says, The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. So he's saying, it's not just what I wrote down, <laughs> or it's not what, just what I spoke, but it's what I lived. And this life, I received it. 
Okay. Um, so um, this is uh, so again. The holy tradition is is a lifestyle or is a life that we receive from our forefathers, from uh, the church fathers of the church, from our servants, from the generation of saints who have come before us. And our obligation is to also keep that and transfer it as best as we can um, unscathed to the following generation. <coughs> um, just touching on, on how it is more of a life rather than a writing or a teaching. Um, for example, if there's a parent or a father who's going to raise a child, he can't just hand him a book on everything there is to learn about life. He can maybe write some rules or guidance or letters if he's not present, or even make a video, but it's still not enough. The, what does the child have to do? If they watch his parent or father and imitate his behavior <coughs> and learn from him what to do and what not to do. Um, and it's almost impossible to just make a book about all the lessons in life that you need to learn, right? Um, you kind of see where I'm getting at, but we're, uh, we're going to touch a little bit today on um, what um, some people call the sola scriptura. You know what that phrase refers to? Basically saying we only need the Bible and that's it. Everything else we can throw by the wayside. Um, We'll get more into it when we when we uh, we respond to some of the <coughs> non-orthodox Christian teachings, um, but uh, that's as you'll see. That's where we're getting it. So, just to summarize, what's the difference between what the holy tradition is, how we define it, and what are the traditions of men, right? Um, so, here's just some some um, characteristics. So the first thing, we look at the source. What's the source of the tradition? If it's God, it's holy. It's a holy tradition. If it's man, it, it can be um, thrown out. Okay? Um, but keep in mind, there's some traditions, or a lot of the holy tradition is given to us from God through the church. So there's a difference between a man and the church. Does that make sense? Um, so what does it produce? If it produces righteousness, then it's, it's a holy tradition. If it produces hypocrisy, then <coughs> this is what the Lord was talking about when he condemned the Pharisees. How is it enforced and interpreted? Is it through the church or is it through a person? Um, even if it's a group of, of, of people, but they don't represent the church, then that's not a holy tradition. Okay? How is it passed on from generation to generation? Or you can pinpoint a, a, a time in which it started and... It, it doesn't continue, okay? Um, what is it based on? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, what is it based on? Is it based on the life and teachings and example of the Lord Christ? Uh, or is it uh, uh, just based on someone's past knowledge or knowledge of the past, okay? Um, what is the main message of it? Is, the, is it for the salvation of the believer? Or is there no general main message for all of these things that are, that are connected, unrelated? So, uh, a few other points. Uh, how is it developed? Is there, is there a dynamic state of development or is it static? Um, again, we have to clarify what I mean by this because uh, one of the theologians says that uh, he gives the example of how the church um, is dynamic by it. okay this is not a theological uh, eg example but basically he says the, the Lord had two he, he, he united in his person two natures what are they he didn't have to give a talk on Christology <laughs> he is fully human his humanity and fully God right so he's saying his divinity never changed, right? Because he's always God, and he was always God even before he took flesh um, and after he ascended to the heavens. But he became man at a certain period in time, and he, he wasn't born a uh, full-grown man, but just like all of us. So that humanity changed or developed or grew over time, okay? But the divinity, you know, uh, never changed. 
So here he was, uh, this writer was saying, that's the same thing with the holy tradition. There's some things that we change or that are developed, but the spirit of the whole tradition remains the same. Kind of like we were talking about last week, you know, we have to change to remain the same. So the things that remain the same, that's the dogma, that's the teachings, that's um, the spirit of the church, but there's some customs, or not customs, but some uh, th things we go, the way we go about doing things might be altered or developed uh, slightly. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. No? <laughs> okay. I don't think our Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example just to kind of respond to that. Um, in the early church, uh, when they started performing baptisms, how did they do it? Did they do it like we do now? We get a big font and uh, we fill it up with water and we pour the oils in it. They, first of all, they didn't even have the oils at that time <laughs> in, the, in the very early church. Okay, um, So there were some guidelines that the church says that this is what we prefer but if we have to, like, do certain things. So, for example, he said, um, the, the, one of the, the holy apostles wrote, um, or the, the apostolic constitutions, said, we prefer that the baptism is done in um, <coughs> cold running water, right? Like the J River Jordan. But, he said, if, if that's not possible, <laughs> let it be, you know, in, 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 in a basin or in a container. Um, but if the person is too sick or whatever to, to be immersed, the church also allows sprinkling, um, like for a baby who's an incubator or um, uh, someone who is um, uh, bedridden, right? So this is what I mean by being dynamic. Like there's some things we can alter, but the baptism is the baptism. Um, we have a preference of how to use, uh, how to do the sacrament, but we can alter it as, as long as we get to the main point that they're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit using water and the prayers and the priest. Even with the baptism, there's an exception. If there's no priest available and it's an emergency situation, the church allows that a layman can perform this in emergency situations. You don't even need a priest because their salvation depends upon it if it's a life-threatening. Uh, so that's what we're talking about with the dynamic. I, I, I don't want to go necessarily into the details with, with the Mayroon, but um, even like um, if we look at a lot of the things that the church does now compared to a thousand years ago, just be, like uh, there were candles lit in all the church, now we use lights. Is, is it wrong that we're using light? Should everything be done by candlelight just because that's what they did a thousand years ago? As long as there's not a theological uh, uh, problem with it, you know, it's okay. Um, so, like with the Mayroon, we needed certain oils. It doesn't, the way that they receive the oil by extracting it, um, it's, not, it's not written that it's wrong to extract it in a different way. Um, but because in the past the extraction took hours, they would do a lot of prayers in the meantime. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, maybe next week when the bishop comes, he can give a longer explanation. <laughs> uh, <coughs> um, so that's what we mean by being uh, dynamic. Uh, what is the target or what is the goal and, and how we get there as long as we're not making any mistakes or going against any other traditions, we're okay. Um, so that's the, the eighth point. Is there a contradiction with this thing that we're looking at with the Bible or other church traditions? If there's a contradiction, it's not a holy tradition. Um, but if there's no contradiction and it falls along the line of the holy tradition, it's okay. Um, and how is it related? Nine is the same thing. How is it related to the Holy Bible? Does it preserve the words of the Bible? Does it help us interpret it in, in the, the right spirit? And is, is there consistency? Or 
<coughs> sorry, is there a lot of contradictions? Okay. Um, so, like for example, what are what some things that are holy traditions? Anyone? It's not a hard question. It's not a trick question. <laughs> the holy mysteries, right? The holy sacraments. Um, changing uh, the the day of the Lord from Saturday to Sunday. It, it was the same spirit uh, that 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 the early, or we can say, the the Israelites had, um, and that was written in the Old Testament, but. It had to be changed to Sunday because the Lord rose from the dead, right? That doesn't mean we have the authority to change it on Monday just because we feel like it because that goes against the Bible teachings and the church teachings and even the reason why they change it from Saturday to Sunday. Um, facing East. Um, so I don't even think we're facing East here, but when we go build the new church, it's going to face East. So that's what we're talking about. Um, we're adapting... Uh, or bypassing those regulations because we have to, because we have to pray practically. Um, but if we have to, we're going to do it the right way. Okay. Um, what's not holy tradition? There, there's a lot of things. Um, but for example, like eating the dates on Nairuz <laughs> or the New Year. Yes, there's a symbolic meaning, but we don't have to do it. And if we don't do it, that doesn't mean we have to go confess to them. Right? It has nothing to do with our salvation. Um, it's just a custom. Um, okay. Uh, let's go a little uh, more in, in depth. So, <coughs> like we were talking about the, the oral tradition, uh, and I won't, uh, I won't, I can go a, a lot into this point, but I'll try to be brief. Um, but like we were saying um, last Sunday, there are a lot of things that were held as oral, oral teachings or holy tradition even before anything was written down. Examples? Like um, the animal sacrifice that were offered in Genesis. You know, Genesis was written a thousand years at least before what happened. So how did they know to offer sacrifices? It was an oral tradition. Um, how, did they know, how did Joseph know adultery was wrong when he fled his master's house? Because of the, the oral tradition or because of the Spirit of God that, um, that taught him and his, uh, his forefathers. Okay? Um, and, and this is mentioned, this oral tradition is mentioned by the Lord God in the book of Deuteronomy, um, where God says, Take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. So here is the spirit of, okay, there's a teaching that you have seen and have witnessed, and you need, your responsibility is to transfer it from generation to generation. Uh, again, this was taught them before even Deuteronomy was written. Okay, um, like we said. Um, we won't go into the other example but there's tons of other examples in both the Old and the New Testament of how things were passed on orally which means which shows that uh, if it's not written down that doesn't mean it's not a holy tradition okay um, so even in the New Testament we see the same spirit as we do in the Old like when the Lord chose his disciples to accompany him day and night for years to absorb his teachings and to learn directly from him, he sent them um, to, deci to disciple the nations after they were good disciples. So the concept of discipleship is interlinked with holy tradition. Um, we can't just send you an email every week, okay, here's the, the message of today, right? We have to come together and uh, not just partake of the mysteries, but... Um, share together in the fellowship and the communion and the discipleship when we sit at the feet of the Lord and, and learn with Him uh, and experience the power and the work and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit among us. Okay? Um, and we said there were some verses, that we mentioned a couple of verses before, of what, uh, especially the, the Protestant brethren, use uh, to say tradition is bad. 
But there's so many other verses in the New Testament as well as the Old that show the importance of having a tradition. Like St. Paul says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught. Is that the traditions of men? No. Is it just the written? He says, whether by word or our epistle. He says, both the written and the oral. You have to keep. Um, and again, this is the Bible teaching us the importance of the tradition that is outside of the Bible. Um, there, there's tons of other verses. I didn't have room to put all of them. But we'll just put a couple more. Um, Again, St. Paul writes to the Thessalonians this time, Withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. So there is a spirit, and if there's someone that's not walking in the same road or of the spirit, uh, withdraw from them, St. Paul says. Why? So you don't get influenced by um, their false teachings. Again, um, the importance of transferring from generation to generation. St. Paul writes here to St. Timothy, the things which have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. How many generations of transferring do we see here? <coughs> Let's count. Okay, so the things which you have heard from me. So St. Paul number one, St. Timothy number two. Okay, among many witnesses, so there's another group, right? Commit these to faithful men, the, the fourth group who are transferring, so not just witnessing, but the people who are receiving, who, and these men will be able to teach others also. Okay, so he's, he's showing, okay, from St. Timothy, St. Paul to St. Timothy, um, many people witness this, commit these to others who are able to also transfer this uh, holy uh, life to the next generation. Okay, um, this is this is what we're talking. This is why uh, we mention the word so much, or we emphasize the importance of being in the church, because the church is the one who gives us the holy tradition. Okay, um, and again, it's not man-made, but it's given by the Lord or from the Lord. Like Saint Paul again says, "I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions, just as I delivered them to you." So he's saying, okay, I gave them to you, keep them. But I didn't make it up from myself. He says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. So whatever I gave to you, I got from the Lord. I didn't make it up. Okay. Um, but, and then he talks about the mystery of the Eucharist or the sacrament of the communion. Um, <clears throat> of course, that's not the only thing that he received from the Lord, but that's the culmination of the life that we were talking about. Okay, let's go a little bit more, uh, just for the sake of time, into in depth of, of responding to the to the importance of holy scripture and how it's related to the holy tradition. Um, bless you. Holy tradition, like we say, was seen as a legacy f from the apostles. Uh, so the church was guided and directed to a certain interpretation of scripture, not just the scripture, but how we understand it, or how. Um, how we live it. So um, the apostles were the first generation of people who witnessed from the Lord how to live this holy life, not just how to teach it. Um, and again, like we were saying last week, this is, if we have Holy Scripture, just that alone proves the importance of needing tradition to have Holy Scripture. Um, so, uh, for example... Um, for the people who say we only take the Bible a simple question you can ask them is well, how did you get the Bible? <laughs> how do you know that this Bible is authentic and there's not an extra book or someone didn't take something out? They, they won't have a response they might go into some history but ultimately there has to be an authority that says this belongs here whether it was now or a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, like when we were talking about the Old Testament scripture. So that proves that there needs to be um, an authority that tells us this belongs and this doesn't belong. Um, and if it holds true and steadfast from generation to generation, that, that's, that's what we call the holy tradition that's given to us through the church. Um, I kind of skipped the, 
this part about how we understand the old through the Christological interpretation. But basically all this is saying is that the Lord and the Apostles taught us how to look at the scripture and how to understand it in the, in the light of especially Christ and how he is the beginning and the end of all things. Um, so like with Jonah, he, he helped us understand the story of Jonah by referring to himself and his burial and resurrection. Right? Um, same thing with the bronze serpent. We understand what that meant because it points us to what? The story of the bronze serpent in the wilderness. They looked at it and if they were bitten by a serpent, they would live. So this was a symbol or a type of what? The holy cross, right? Um, and so on and so forth. So um, how do we understand the way we, we need to um, interpret the Bible? We go to Christ and the apostles and the church because it's the same way of interpretation um, from, from that he teaches us. Okay? Um, we'll move on. Um, so what about the things that are not written? And we talked about this in the past, so I won't, uh, I, I won't focus on it. But basically, there's so many things that are not written. Like, if I, th I don't know if I told you this last time, but if you, if you uh, list all of the things that are written in the life of the Lord Christ that are mentioned in the Gospels, how many years do you think it will comprise? Or how many months? Just by the instances themselves that are written. One a scholar uh, calculated 18 days. <laughs> so all that is <laughs> in the gospel just is, is basically about 1% of his life. So what about the other 99% of his, at least of his three-year ministry? Um, well, that's what we say is holy tradition. Okay? Um, and St. John points to it at the end of his gospel. After he finishes his 21 chapters, he says there's, there's much more. How do you get it? Holy tradition. Okay. <coughs> so, um, a couple more slides and we'll finish. But, um, like I was saying before, how do we get the Holy Scriptures? Um, well, there were some guidelines that the church set to accept or reject certain books. This is just a very simple introduction. But here are some of the characteristics or, or qualifications. First, it had to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. It had to have the true Orthodox teaching. Um, it had to be written by one of the Apostles, obviously. Um, it had to date to, to the time of the Apostles. Um, and how the Church used it after that. So like, for example, if someone says, I just found um, in uh, the Dead Sea a scroll of a new book that wasn't used... So it should be the 28th book in the, in the New Testament. Say, well, did the church fathers use it? No, but I just found it. Well, then it's not part of Holy Scripture. <laughs> um, because if, if, it, if God wanted it to be Scripture, He would have made it uh, available to us all from, from that time. Okay? Um, but if you see like a lot of the... Uh, scrolls and things that they found in Qumran and just in, in, in the Middle East uh, uh, a few decades ago, um, that all supported the, the scriptures that we had uh, from, genera from generations ago. Um, so there's nothing new. Um, another thing is if the church fathers didn't refer to it even though it existed at that time, that's also pointing to the point that it, it, it's not... Um, uh, an inspired book okay not only did how the church fathers used it but did we use it in the prayers did we read it in the divine liturgy or did the, the liturgy refer to those words okay um, so this is just an example of, uh, of how we got it um, so there's one other point that we have to uh, mention here is that it's not just important that we have the Holy Bible, but we need to learn how to use it. I don't like uh, 
referring to, to, to movies, but there was a, a, a funny movie one that I, uh, I watched when I was growing up. It was called The Gods Must Be Crazy. Did anyone see that movie? <laughs> Okay, I'm not going to encourage you to, to watch it, but basically what happened is this, this tribe in Africa, this African uh, was in the desert, or in the, sorry, where, where he was a tribe in, in the middle of nowhere, and then all of a sudden a plane flies by and the pilot throws out an empty Coke bottle, <laughs> right? And so he sees it coming from the sky <laughs> and he thinks this is from God, right? And the whole time, he and the rest of the tribe are trying to figure out what it's supposed to be used for. If it's from God, then it's very important. So they, they think to use it as a hammer or to use it you know, to make music and, and things like that. So um, the point is they received it. They, think, they thought it was from God, but they didn't know how to use it. <laughs> um, and... What they needed, I don't remember if this will happen, I don't think it happened in the, in the movie, but what they needed was someone who either made the bottle or is familiar with how it was used and why it was used to teach them and to educate them. So if like Mr. Coca-Cola came <laughs> and taught them and explained, this is how I made it and this is why I used it, um, they, they would have an understanding. So that's what we have with the Bible. Um, not only did we have this... Um, gift coming from God in the heavens, but God himself came and showed us how to use it. Um, even if the, uh, the Old Testament people got the, word of, uh, the, got the misunderstanding of how to use the, the word of God properly, the Lord Jesus Christ helped correct their misunderstandings. That was another reason why he came. And he taught his disciples this importance and they also taught from generation to generation. So we need someone experienced to teach us and to show us how to use the scriptures. And that's what the Church Fathers is so uh, essential uh, for us when it comes to Holy Scripture. Um, so there's a big problem when people say, okay, we just need the Bible, we don't need the Church, we don't need the, the Fathers, <coughs> we don't need the sacraments. Like, okay, you, now you just have the empty Coke Bible and you have, like... Anyway, sorry, I don't mean to disrespect. Um, so, um, just one quote and we'll finish. Um, uh, Vincent of Lorraine, I think I'm pronouncing it accurately, he was a 5th century um, uh, church uh, saint. I guess he's a saint in the West. Uh, I'm not even sure if the Coptic Church recognizes it, but other Orthodox churches recognize him as saint. Anyway, um, he... He wrote this about the importance of tradition, and it hits home even to us today. That, that's why I, I thought it was important for us to read uh, through it. It's just a couple of slides. He says, um, I often earnestly approached learned and holy men who knew Christian doctrine, asking how can I distinguish the truth of the universal faith from the falsehood of heresy? So how can I tell if this is the true orthodox faith or this is a her heresy? He says, in almost every instance, they have told me that if I or anyone else want to detect heresy, avoid the traps set by heretics and maintain the true faith, how do I know what's the right faith? He says, I must, with the help of the Lord, reinforce my own belief with two things. The authority of the Holy Scriptures, so go back to the Bible and accept it as uh, inspired breath of God. Um, and second, the tradition of the church. And then he continues, at this... <coughs> At this point, someone may say, um, or wish to ask, since the canon of Scripture is complete, meaning we have the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, um, why do we need the church? Why do we need the authority of the church's interpretation? Um, so here's his response in the 5th century. So that's a good question, but there's a simple answer we all know if we think a moment. Because the depth of the scriptures, they are not interpreted in the same sense by everyone. So everyone is using the Coke bottle differently. Okay? <coughs> one understands a text to mean one thing, and another thinks what it means another. Sometimes, if there, if, sometimes it seems there are as many interpretations as there are interpreters. So, I mean, if you think about it, where did all the heretics come? I mean, they knew the Bible. They even knew it very well, and they extracted certain verses to support their point. But the problem was, 
they took their own thinking and their own spirit rather than following the thinking or the mind of Christ and, and the teaching of the church. He says, consequently, because of the intricacies of all these heresies and incorrect doctrines, we must formulate our understanding of the writings of the apostles and prophets in harmony with the standards of ecclesiastical <coughs> and, ortho <coughs> sorry, and orthodox interpretation. That's why we go to the fathers and to the church to explain the Holy Bible for us or to give us the way of interpretation. Okay? Um, St. Athanasius also says on this point, he says, if Arius um, would have been remained faithful to the church's interpretation of Scripture, he wouldn't have made a mistake. He wouldn't have uh, f fallen into heresy and come up with his own idea of uh, that there was a time that the Lord Christ was not God. Um, Okay, so um, this comes to the, to the, to the last uh, uh, verse where we say no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. That doesn't mean we can't read the Bible at our own homes and understand, but we have to understand within the same spirit of what the church teaches us. Um, and that's what the Ethiopian eunuch um, realized when he um, was reading the book of Isaiah and he's like, I, and, and Philip, St. Philip comes to him and says, do you understand? He's like, how can I understand? I need the church. Um, he wasn't even baptized, so that also shows that he wasn't a member of the church to even comprehend the depth or the meaning of the scripture. <coughs> because the point, the, the, the place in Isaiah that he was reading was referring to Christ. So if he's not baptized believing in the divinity of Christ, how can the Holy Spirit open his heart to accept Christ? Um, so, that's what we say. This is the interpretation that we receive through the Holy Tradition. Um, sorry, one more quote and we'll finish. Um, uh, one Orthodox bishop uh, writes, he says, um, Orthodox Christians of today see themselves as heirs and guardians to a rich inheritance received from the past, and they believe that it is their duty to transmit this inheritance unimpaired to the future. Yes, so uh, just like passing on the baton, we... We are heirs, so we have received this as an inheritance, but we have to be guardians because we also pass it down as an inheritance. It says, an orthodox thinker must see tradition from within. So it's not just the customs that we do. Okay, Abuna stands up here and turns around and, and blesses the people. Now, okay, that, that's the outward, but he says, we have to enter into the inner spirit. Um, the meaning, uh, we might not understand everything, so we still keep it, but... Um, there are probably people out there who do understand every, everything. And we're still learning um, a lot of the depth of this mystery. So he says he must enter into its inner spirit. He must re-experience <coughs> the meaning of tradition in a manner that is exploratory, courageous, and full of imaginative cre creativity. I mean, this is what we're talking about, the dynamism here. That... Um, we have to be willing to explore and to understand what we're doing and why we're doing. And that kind of goes back to the question before of, like, that's why um, uh, His Holiness the Pope and the Holy Synod decided to explore and to be courageous and take the step and say, okay, why do we have to do, um, to extract the oils in the typical way? Why can't we use um, uh, uh, the current, the science of the day and uh, apply it as long as we're not uh, destroying the holy tradition. Then he says, <coughs> <coughs> um, sorry, one more point on this. Um, so, some people think that when we're preserving the church tradition, that means we cancel the personality or the individuality um, of, of the member of the church or their relationship with God. That, that, that's the opposite, actually. Um, the Orthodox Church believes that, that without exaggerating to go one extreme to another, um, the, the believer's faith and relationship with God increases when they hold fast to the Holy Tradition. It doesn't decrease and it doesn't make them robots. It actually does the opposite. Um, so again, the Holy Tradition, he says, is a life, a personal encounter with Christ and the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's, it's, it's not just following a list of rules and regulations. Um, tradition is not only kept by the church, it lives in the church, it is the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. So when you see it this way, um, it, 
it's not a set of rules and regulations that we have to adhere to just to be orthodox but it's something that helps us grow deeper in the Lord and to experience the Holy Spirit um, uh, who is um, the founder and the author of, of the church uh, and the one who helps keeping it uh, going. Um, and again, the, the personal relationship of the believer with the Lord, the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit only in, increases uh, after adhering and submitting themselves to uh, the authority of God. Uh, any questions? I hope that made sense. I, I know it was a little um, more academic than, than, than usual, like there's a lot of points, but this is just to give you some um, tools or verses or uh, power for, for when someone does ask you, you know, why don't you just keep the Holy Bible? See, we do, but it's a lot more, the church is a lot more than the holy book. It's the holiest of all books, and it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but don't limit the Holy Spirit just to the Holy Bible. How do we live it? How do we understand it? How do we interpret it? How do we even accept it? Um, and the answer is um, God, the, the Holy Spirit, through the church, helps us understand His written word. Glory be